Okay, cool. Hi, sorry for the late start. I blame Yella. No, I don't blame Yella. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, okay. Um, so, background. Um, who, know, who doesn't know what a monoidal category is? Who doesn't know what a Nash equilibrium is? Okay, okay. Okay, that's good, because category theory is harder to explain than game theory. Okay, so, um, okay, so if I spend just a few minutes on kind of classical game theory. Um, so in a, if you have a, so a simultaneous game, you have N players choosing simultaneously. So um, I say the i player has a set XI of choices. So all the players choose simultaneously, which means that they're independently choosing pieces of a, a tuple like this. And then, um, and then the i player has a, a payoff function, which will take all of the choices made by all of the players and give them a, give them a real number. So the, the, the basic setup in game theory is you've got n players whose choices all together determine payoffs in some arbitrarily complicated way. And then each player is trying to make their personal choice in order to maximize their personal uh, payoff, but they have to take into account what everybody else is going to do. Um, so this means you have to do, you're in some kind of fixed pointy situation. Um, so, so the basic, um, the basic kind of uh, sanity criterion for, for choices of players is Nash equilibrium. And a Nash equilibrium is a set of choices, so it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, vector, of, a vector of choices, one choice for each player, with the property that for each player i, the payoff that the i-th player gets from everybody following that is at least as big as the payoff that they would get if they, if everybody else stayed the same and the i-th player switches to some, some xi prime. That's so that is to say, um, this thing is stable against unilateral deviations. So for each player, if just that player, vary, if you vary just that player's move and keep everybody else as fixed, then that player's choice is maximal for their payoff. Um, so I could also write this as uh, x. The actual ith element of, of the choice is in the argmax over x prime of, of this thing. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic setup. Um, so to give some examples, um, so, so prisoner's dilemma is the most famous example, so I might as well use that. Um, so here we have two players, so, uh, so n is two. We have um, the choice sets of both players is C and D, which is, stands for cooperate and defect. And then we have, uh, we have, okay, I'll, I'll write this out. Uh, how does this go? Um, CC would be um, one, CC zero, DC would be uh, three, Q1, DD would be two. And player twos would be one, three, zero, two. Okay, so the reason this is this is an interesting example is that this game has exactly one Nash equilibrium, which is CC. Because, well, so let's see why. So, so the reason this is interesting is you would think that both players want to play DD because they both receive a higher payoff. So why can't? So why isn't DD a Nash equilibrium? Well, player one would uh, player one would prefer to. No, hang on. Have I got this the wrong way around? These, yeah. Yeah, this is right. I got something backwards. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, 051, so you go down to the undergrad social area. Uh, you. What? It should be signposted. Yeah, the yeah, so it means cooperate with the other player. Oh, okay, then yeah. Sticks, yeah. sticks to the agreement, yeah, uh, uh, which, which is, yeah. Uh, um, so this is why I shouldn't try to reconstruct, like, uh, eight numbers from memory. Um, so which way around does this go? Yeah. Right, yes. Okay, perfect. So this one is the unique, unique Nash equilibrium. Um, so you would think that they would prefer to do this, but um, let's say you, we're doing this and player one gets a chance to unilaterally deviate. Well, they can increase their, um, they can increase their payoff from two to three by deviating from C to D. And I've written the definition so that player I only cares about player I's payoff. They're completely, they, they have no preferences whatsoever about the other player's payoff. So they're, um, so they're kind of perfectly greedy in some sense. They, they, they only optimize their own payoff. Um, so, so this is a game with a unique Nash, Nash equilibrium. Um, I could set up, let's say I did matching pennies where, um, oh, I could write it like um, x, y is one, if s x equals y, zero if x not equal to y, and player two's payoff is the opposite. So, so player one, so so player one and two simultaneously call c or d. If they call the same thing, player one gets payoff. If they call different things, player two gets payoff. And that's an example with no no Nash equilibrium. What it does have is a probabilistic Nash equilibrium, um, which is what Nash is what what John Nash won the uh, Nobel Prize for, but, yeah. So you only look at like, what are X and Y doing for their final payoff? Uh, C and D, for example. Still C and D? Yeah, for example. And then the Nash equilibrium is only one of those cases where it's not going to be uniform. I, th I think what happened is uh, um, he was the first person to write it down clearly and kind of, his theorem made it interesting for the first time. Okay, um, now we can also have dynamic games. So in a dynamic game, let's say um, first player one chooses from X and then player two chooses from Y. This is not official notation. Now, um, so now we need to distinguish between moves and strategies. So, so players, so, so player one moves first, they don't observe anything. So a strategy for player one is just a choice of move. So, so player one's strategy, which I'll write sigma, is, is just a choice. But player two's strategy, player two can observe what player one does. So player two's strategy can be a choice of y given an x. So a strategy is a function. Now, um, Now, what does it mean to be a Nash equilibrium this, in this situation? Well, um, for player one, for player one, and, and we have we have also so the payoff functions just care about the moves the moves that get played. Okay, so you need to be very very clear about this. You have you have strategies which are behavioral specifications of what the player will do in different situations, kind of counterfactually. And then you also have plays, which is what kind of physically gets, at what physically actually happens in a run of the game. Um, and the payoff function is, is, is just a function of, of the play. So the payoff function can't read the player's minds and know what, the, what they would have done in some other situation. Um, so, so let's say our strategy, let's say we have the strategy profile. So a strategy profile is a tuple of strategies. So let's say we have the strategy profile sigma one, sigma two. Um, so the payoff for player one in this situation is 
So, so this thing here is the play that happens from playing that strategy. So first sigma one happens, and then sigma two is run on sigma one. Um, so that should be bigger than everything that player one could get by deviating. And what player one would get by deviating, player two is still playing sigma two. You see? So this means that player, player two strategy kind of should be robust against other things that player one might do. So these are the conditions to be in Ash equilibrium for this sequential game. Okay, so I could spend an hour talking about talking about classical game theory, but like whatever, it's boring. Um, I think this is this is kind of enough background. I'll be I'll be filling filling in bits of intuition as we go along if it's if it's necessary. This should be, this is for all x dash, for all y dash. Um, yes, you, you need, you need, the only complication, well, there's a couple of complications. One is that you have a player, each player moves more than one time, so you need to account for that, which is okay. Um, and then the other thing is that this thing has variable length, which is a little bit more complicated. So, so for that, you'd start with an, ex um, so that's the extensive form game of perfect information. So you, you just need a, a more detailed framework to talk about it. But von Neumann, of course, it was von Neumann, wrote down the framework for doing that. So we're going to be building we're going to be building these equilibrium conditions compositionally. That's what we're doing. Okay. So I'm going to start by um, the way I explain open games now, nowadays is I explain the, what could be called the category of lenses first. Only I'll probably remove it from the lens intuition because that's mostly a distraction. Um, okay. So I'm going to define a category completely out of the blue, and then later on it's going to turn out to be useful. That's, that's just how it goes. So, so the category, I'm going to call it PC. So PC stands for play and co-play. Um, but it's also, you could also call it lens, as in the category whose morphisms are lenses, roughly. So. So PC is a category where the objects are going to be pairs of sets. And the morphisms are going to be determined by a pair of functions where the first function is called v, which is a function from x to y. And the second function is called u, and this is the weird one, and this goes from x times r to s. Okay, so what is it? So the way I think of this is roughly, so, so x and y are kind of ordinary kind of data types with uh, functions between them. So, so think of this. Think of this as a function from x to y with some extra information being carried around. So, so fundamentally, this is a function from x to y. The extra information being carried around is some kind of it's some stuff about valuation or, or payoff. It's so, so, so think of it like this. So, so call this call this f so we're trying to associate some extra some extra information to f which is a function from x to y so 
So, the, so this function says that if you know x and you know how good f of x is, then you know how good x was. So it's kind of propagating, it's, it's back propagating some kind of valuation or evaluation or, or profit or payoff or something, some, some, some sort of value-y thing associated to, associated to the domain and codomain of this function where they're being propagated backwards. So I'll say that again. If you, if, you, if you know x and you know how good f of x is in some abstract sense, then you know how good x was. So open games is about you have uh, indexed families of these things and you're trying to choose an index that kind of gives you the best value, roughly. Okay, so I said this was a category. It's not obvious in which way it's a category. So, for example, the identities, what's the identity on, on an object xs? Well, we need a function from x to x, that's the identity on x, and we need a function from x times s to s, that's the projection. Now we want to compose. Okay, so suppose we have one of these and one of these. So now we want to compose these together to, to go directly from here to here. So that means, well, first of all, we need to go from x to z. Well, we can do that because we can go from x to y and we can go from y to z. Now, the hard part is we need to go from x, so stare at this, stare at this. We need to go from x times q to s. So we need to define this, and we're given all the, all the pieces of these two things. So this is a bit of a puzzle. So, um, okay, we've got an x and a q. So uh, given the x, we can hit it with v of lambda to get a y. Then we have a y and a q, so we can hit it with u of mu to get an r. So now we have an r, but we still have an x. We didn't throw it away. So now we have an x and an r, so we can get an s. Okay, so since everyone here knows category theory, this tells us that we really have to be in a Cartesian category for this because to define identities we, we projected and to do this we copied. You, you really have to be in a Cartesian category for this, for this thing to work out. Uh, not, not, not in a category with enough comonoids like I claimed in my thesis, that's wrong, it doesn't work. Um, so it's not, it's not at all obvious that this is associative that this is a category, but it is a category. You have to go through the proof. Um, if, you if you replace a Cartesian category with a thing where everything's a comonoid plus all the conditions you like, it, it's not associative. It's very sad. Um, so you can't do it over rel, for example. Um, okay. Um, okay, so that's a category. Um, believe me. Um, Okay, it's also a monoidal category. So for the monoidal product, for the monoidal product, if we have x s and we have x prime s prime, we just do uh, component wise component wise um, um, Cartesian product, and that gives you a genuine tensor. This is this doesn't give you a Cartesian category. Um, it turns out to be actually better if you do the second one backwards, but I won't go into that. They're equivalent, but that one's a bit neater. Um, okay, so let's say we have a let's say we have a lambda from x s to y r, and we have a lambda prime from x prime s prime to y prime r prime. And we want to take a tensor of them to go from the product of these to the product of these. So we need to go from x times x prime to y times y prime, which we can do because we can go from x to y and we can go from x prime to y prime. And so that is to say, I'm going to start drawing string diagrams now.
and the other one, we need to go from um, So that's a string diagram in the Cartesian monoidal category of sets, by the way. Um, x, so we need to go from x times x prime times r times r prime to s times s prime. So we do this. Okay, then you have to do a ton of work to prove that this is a symmetric monoidal category, but it is a symmetric monoidal category, um, which you have two options. You can either brute force it or do it uh, the smart way, and they're both equally annoying. Okay, so all of this was completely unmotivated. Um, so now I get to give you the definition of an open game. Oh no, first I'll do, first I'll do the, uh, the context functors, okay. Okay. I'm gonna define two functors from PC to set. One of them is covariant called V, and one of them is contravariant called K. So V is easy because V just extracts the forwards part. So on objects, it gives you it gives you the first of the two sets, and on lenses, it extracts the, the V part. So this is kind of pretty obviously, pretty obviously a functor, um, pretty obviously a monoidal functor, in fact. Um, but what's nice is that V turns out to be the, uh, oh, I didn't mention that the monoidal unit of PC is the set one one. This should be, this should be obvious because tensor product is Cartesian product pairwise. Um, so, okay. So this turns out to be the covariant functor represented by the, by the monoidal unit. Um, why is that? Well, a what is what is a lens of this type? Well, it's a function from one to x, which is just an element of x, which is what we want, and a function from one times s to one, which is unique because one is terminal. Okay, so, um, okay, there'll be some string diagrams in this category coming up. Um, the, and maybe I should, maybe I can draw some string diagrams now. Um, So, so okay. Remember the string diagrams that I drew before were in just the category of sets. These are now string diagrams in in the category PC. Um, so, so top to bottom is really monoidal product. And um, this thing geometrically has oriented arrows for the things on the first part of the set. First part of the pairs are going forwards, and things on the second part of the pairs are going backwards. Um, and this really captures what's going on. Uh, I'm going to come back and say more about this this diagram language. Um, but what it means is that um, an element of X can really be written like this. Uh, so this is, this is a state in kind of applied monoidal categories language. And in fact, we can, we can, we can put in an arbitrary, arbitrary S and prove that the only thing we can do to this S would be to delete it. Okay, now K is much more interesting. So K is called the continuation functor. 
Um, and this is where a lot of the game theory starts to come in. Uh, in disguise. So K on a pair X, S gives you the set of functions from X to S. That is to say, uh, these are two different notations. Okay, now writing, writing the action of this on, on morphisms um, takes a bit of work. So, so let's say we have lambda going from xs to yr. So k is contravariant, so we want to write a function k of lambda which goes from r to the y to s to the x. So, so let's say we give it an input k. So k is a function from y to r. Okay. So this should be a function from s to uh, from x to s. So let's say we give it an input, call it x. This is tight directed programming. Okay. Now you do everything that you can possibly think of. So we need to produce an, an S. So, um, so this will be a U of something. Uh, so this needs an, an X and an R. Will we have an X? How do we get an R? Will we have a function to R? Okay, so now we need a Y. How do we get a Y? Well, we can, we can hit this with V. Okay, there we go. So you have to prove that this is a functor. Again, this is not obvious that this is a functor, but it is a functor. Now what's really neat is that K turns out to be a contravariant functor represented by the, by the noisy unit. So there's an exact duality between these two things. So why is this? So what's a lens of this type? Well, it's a function from x to 1, which is unique because 1 is terminal, and it's a function from x times 1 to s, which is a function from x to s. Okay? So in this category, co-states or effects, that's morphisms into the monoidal unit, are, are in bijection with functions, which is, this is what I call continuations. Um, so they look like this. These things are the same as functions from x to s. So, okay. So this tells you that the fact that these things are kind of symmetric but so different to each other tells you that this is a very weird category because, well, let's say x equals s and we put in the identity function, we get a special... We get a special effect, special effect, yes, um, which is this. Um, and this really behaves like the co-units in a compact closed category. But going this way, any S that goes in here, the only thing we can do to it is delete it. So that's not allowed. We can draw it. Um, it's because, so implicitly there's a one here and a one here. So this has to be, it, it's because, it's really because of the, the asymmetry that you have a function from here to here and a function from here to turns here to here. But none, none of these gives, neither of those gives you a way to get from here to here. Asymmetric, yes. So it's, it's, it's forever unclear whether this is a bug or a feature. It has, it has, uh, has features of both a bug and a feature. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also very annoying to not be able to do this sometimes. Um, I mean, there, there are situations where this has an obvious kind of, there's only one possible thing it could mean, but it doesn't mean it. 
Like if you create causal loops in a game, that's very bad, and and you don't you don't know how you should interpret a causal loop. Like you could set up a, a grandfather paradox where you do something if if and only if you don't do it. Um, if if you had if you had full feedback loops and 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 then it's not clear what your game theory becomes. It becomes some weird uh, like computable game theory or or relational game theory or something um, that's 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 different to classical game theory. Um, but if you do, if you don't have a loop, kind of if you want to be able to interpret this, then, and it's annoying. So anyway, um, so so this is one of the one of the open research questions. There's a couple of there's a couple of possibilities for putting these back in in a mathematically coherent way, but the math is really hard. Um, no, I mean adding it formally isn't very much use because then you don't get a semantics. The the units the full the full symmetry. So, ex extending or either extending or restricting this category, modifying it in some way so that it becomes compact closed essentially, because it, it 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 has it looks like it wants to be compact closed, but it's not. Okay, I'll 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 tell you th the two different ways that, um, th the two different ways that I know that will work, and there was a third way that turned out to fail, which was my preferred way. Um, one is that if the base category is Cartesian traced, uh, for example, if it's a category of computable functions, so this is the thing where the, so, so in a, in a, my intuition is in a typical Cartesian trace category, the trace is kind of computational feedback, computational recursion, um, then, then this category actually embeds into the int construction. And so replacing it with int c uh, should, be, should work, I think. But I'm not sure what happens to the game theory. So, so int, so the int construction is a more symmetric version of this. Now, the other way is that I conjecture that PC is a complete category, and so you can take spans of it. Um, but proving it's complete is quite scary. I've done as like I, I'm chipping away at the proof. Oh, you need pullbacks. Yeah, proving it has. Proving it has pullbacks is, is hard work. So, yeah, working on that. So, <laughs> anyone that wants to do some category theory? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it does have products, which helps a little bit. Um, okay, um, oh, another thing is, okay, so there's, so we have two different We have two different embeddings of set. Um, one takes um, one takes the set x to x one, and the other takes x to one x. So what that means is that if you have a function from x to y, we can lift it to either f upper going from x one to y one, which I'm going to write like. like this, or we can lift it to f lower, going from 1 y to 1 x, which I'm going to write like this. Stare at that for 10 seconds. Convince yourselves that I've written the arrows the right way. So, so what's the inputs and what's the outputs? It's Im inputs and outputs is, is, is not Yeah, you could say that. You could say that. It's, I mean, the, the, hmm? Sorry? Yeah, and get a one that, that actually has no. R without the integer. Right. The, the, the kind of, the classic lens intuition kind of broke down. Because we're not doing monomorphic lenses anymore. But, so, uh, Brendan's left. So when it, when it comes to Brenda's talk, he'll be doing monomorphic lenses, which are a simpler variant of this. Um, so, um, so the reason I'm saying this is that if you combine these with this, 
you end up with a theorem Okay, so what is this? So this, this diagram is, so this is a, so this is F forward tensor identity composed with, composed with this co-unit. And it turns out that if you do this, and you work out the, you work out the, the V and U of both, they turn out to be equal. Okay. On the other hand, a general lambda can't be rotated. So in particular, this can't be rotated. So the only things that you can rotate are, th are these liftings. There's nothing else. OK, halfway through. Let's see the definition of open games. So all of this structure, by the way, all of this appears, reappears unchanged in the category of open games. Like there's a, there's a faithful embedding of this category into open games, so all of this is still there. So, so I didn't just waste all that time. So, so all, of this, all of this under a different name is open games with zero players. So all we have to do now is add the players. Category of open games. Um, so, this is an, another category where the objects are pairs of sets. Okay, and the intuition is really the same. You got some forwards, some forward stuff which is like functions between sets, and then you got some backward stuff which is like uh, valuation, valuations being backpropagated. Okay, but now the morphisms are a lot more complicated. So the morphisms are open games. So what is an open game? An open game is, it consists of three things. Okay. So the first thing is a set. So this thing is, um, is the set of strategy profiles. So this is something like um, this is something like the um, the the specifications of all the ways that this game, this game, all the players in this game can behave unconstrained by rationality. Um, so sigma is kind of like all the degrees of freedom in in the behaviour that you have. So already something weird has happened already by this point because in classical in classical game theory you set up a model where you have let's say you start off with n players and then some other stuff. But, but the definition of a game in the classical sense starts with players. Whereas here, we're, and, and then later we build strategy profiles and stuff like that on top of the players. Here we're taking strategy profiles as fundamental. Um, and this is really strange. It leads to some strange stuff. So, so players, in an open game, players have become kind of, they've disappeared a bit. So, so players become a kind of derived concept a bit. Um, you can put them back in, it's okay, but I'm not gonna get that far. And it took me a while to figure out how to put players back in. But it turns out focusing on players is the wrong thing to be compositional. Focusing on strategy profiles is the right thing. Okay, now the second, the second component, so this is, this is supposed to be G, G with a blank, um, is gonna be a sigma indexed family Sigma indexed family of lenses from XS to YR. Okay, so this part so far, I think I've written the definition of family's vibration. So this is just a um, a morphism is a is a set together with a 
family of morphisms indexed by that set in, in some other space category. Okay. The third thing is, so, okay. So the third thing is kind of the key. It's where the game theory happens. So you can think of this as being a thing that just supports the third thing. So the third thing should be sigma g, sigma g, sigma g. So the third thing is going to be a function that chooses a subset of sigma g. So this is going to tell you in a given situation which of the which of the strategy profiles are Nash equilibria. And again, previously Nash equilibria was a derived concept and now it becomes fundamental. And that turns out to be the right thing because this is precisely compositional. Now, what it's a function of is the hard part. So, turns out to be this. So this thing is called a context. So, so an open game has a set of strategy profiles, and in any given context, some of those are Nash equilibria. A context consists of a history. So Medzan went through this yesterday. A history, so a history tells you what happened in the past, and that's already happened, so we can't change it. It's just what it is. And a continuation. Okay, so the continuation tells us what happens in what will happen in the future, and specifically, it tells us the part of what happens in the future that is relevant to us, and the part that's relevant to us is the value coming in here. But the thing is, what happens in the future will depend on what we do now in the present, which is why this is a function of y. So for every choice we could make here, we might get a different value back. So this depends on the choice we make now plus some other stuff in the future. Now, uh, V is view, which I've stolen from Lenvis. Okay, so view terminology is, is here, yes, terminology is still fluid because there's intuition coming from like three different places. Okay. Um, I'm, I, I still haven't completely fixed on the terminology I like. I keep changing my mind, okay. so I'm using a weird mixture. Yes, V is V is view, so view and history is the same thing. So view is what you'd call it when it's a lens. History is what you, well. So history is like state. So just a dictionary. So in lenses, you'd say state. In open games, you'd say state or history because several people like to, call, like to also call this uh, state. Um, uh, that was so co-play is this back propagation. So co-play is what what I call this back propagation until very recently. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't help changing terminology for things, but um, it, trying to focus on something that's intuitive about co-play is, is very hard. Okay, um, I might extend that if some, if some other stuff comes up. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I called these V and U is their view and update. They're coming from lenses. So these are like destructive updates on data in, in usual terminology. Um, okay, now it turns out that this is precisely VXS is V, and this is KYR, okay? So this is just writing the same thing in a more obscure way, except now we, have w now we know how to compose these because these are functors. So now I'm going to tell you the definition of composing two open games together. Okay, 
So we're given two open games, and we need to define these three components of the, of the composition. So, okay, first of all, what is the set of strategy profiles of H compose G? Um, so the idea is, so although players uh, have disappeared, uh, I'm going to still justify things in terms of players. So a strategy profile is a tuple. You should think of it as a tuple consisting of a strategy for each player. And when we join these two games together, so G contains some players and H contains some other players, and when we join them together, we're going to take the disjoint union of the set of players, which means that the strategies, which are functions out of that, are going to compose by Cartesian product. That is to say, a, a strategy profile for G compose H uh, is going to consist of a strategy profile for the players in G together with a strategy profile for the players in H which is to say that this thing composes by Cartesian product. Okay? And secretly, there's something spanny going on, but that's, again, that's uh, research. Okay. Now, we need to define... Okay, we need to define the... the the lens family of H composed G on a typical element of sigma H composed G, which is a pair consisting of an element of this and an element of this. Um, so if you don't know about lenses, this, has, this is lots of hard work, but we've done the hard work already, so this is this. Okay. Now for the fun part. What does it mean to be a Nash equilibrium? Okay, so we've got a context. We have a context for G then H, which means that we have a history that tells us what happened before G, and we have a continuation that tells us what will happen after H. So that is to say, this thing is in B X S and this thing is in K Z G. Okay, and we want to know what are the Nash equilibria, so what are the strategies that are that are stable? Well, to be stable for G compose H, you better be stable for G and stable for H, right? So so to be a Nash equilibrium means that for each individual strategy that makes up that tuple, um, and, and remember, we're thinking of these as themselves being split into, so, so sigma and tau are themselves tuples consisting of a, a strategy for each individual player. Um, so, um, so to be a Nash equilibrium, we want every single player to be individually happy. So, so EG and e EH are designed to tell us whether all of the players in G are happy and whether all of the players in H are happy. So, so for all the players in G compose H to be happy, you want all the players in G to be happy and all the players in H to be happy. So, so what you want is that sigma is in EG of something and tau is in EH of something. Yep. Okay, I will write it again. So think some more about what it means to be a Nash equilibrium. To be a Nash equilibrium, you're talking about players uni uh, deviating unilaterally. So what this means is that, okay, so, so a typical player of, of H compose G is either a typical player of G or they're a typical player of H, so we're going to reason case-wise. So if you're a typical player of, of, of G, you're unilaterally deviating, which means that um, 
you're playing some sigma prime, everybody else is playing, um, everybody else in G is playing sigma, but every single player in H is playing tau, okay? So we can assume that everything in, in H is played according to tau. And conversely, for a perspective of a player in H, we can assume that everything in G is played according to sigma, okay? So, okay, this thing here, this needs a, a state and a continuation. So we need to know what happened before G and what's gonna happen after G. Well, we know what happened before G because we've just been given it, okay? So this here is H. And conversely, this one needs to know what's happening before H and what's happening after H, and we know what's happening after H. Okay? And so the idea is that um, using the fact that, um, so, so we can extend the continuation here backwards using the fact that um, that we know that H is, is, is played with tau. So, so the idea is, so, so we have, we have a, a strategy for tau, right? So we have a lens, H tau. And we also have a continuation from ZQ, which is K. Remember, this was a representable functor, so these things are in bijection with morphisms from the modal unit. Which means the extended continuation turns out to be the composition of these. So you can write it either, you can define it by its representation and say it's this, or it's the action of K on the morphism H tau applied to K. These are, these are depending on exactly how you make the definition, one of these is, is officially the correct one. Um, but this one is kind of nicer to look at. And correspondingly, so okay, it, it's, 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 it's unavoidable to make some kind of ju jump at some point. I think this is where I make the jump. Like this is just, this is, the, the play and co-play, these, these families are set up precisely so that this is the right thing. Um, and conversely, if we have a state coming in here, so this one is actually, is actually um, easier to see. So this one I can go through directly. So this is gonna be uh, G sigma composed H. So this one, okay. So these are both the action of this functor, so I can actually um, uh, unwrap, unwrap what's going on here. So this thing is written officially, this is the action of V on the morphism G sigma of H. But the way that the V was defined on morphisms is, well this thing is a family of, of lenses and V extracts the V part. So it's actually that. So what, what's actually going on is when I wrote that view corresponds to play. So if you unwrap, if you unwrap this, this corresponds to two functions. One is a function going from sigma g times x to y, and one goes from sigma g times x times r to s. So this is playing co-play. So co-play is the kind of infamous thing that nobody can understand and some people say they understand or some people called Neil say they understand. Um, I mean, I invented this thing and I don't claim to understand it at all. Um, but this one, this is the play function. So this is pretty intuitive. This says that if you have a strategy profile and you have um, an observation or an input or a state coming in, you can run the strategy profile on the observation and then, and then you get a a, a tuple of choices coming out. So this, so this thing is really playing. So what this is doing is that we have a state coming in here and then we're playing it 
using the assumption that players in G play according to sigma. Now, the other one is a lot more mysterious. So the other one ends up being um, U, H of T, uh, what is it? Um, oh, it's a, it's a lambda Y dot U H T Y, uh, K V H T Y. So you have to do quite, quite a bit more work to unwrap this in an intuitive way. And eventually you hit the fact that you hit a U and U is coplay, which is very hard to understand. But um, so, so what's happening is, so, so G wants to know the value of a choice in Y given that, given that H plays according to tau, okay? And we have a kind of evaluation here that lets us go round from Z to Q. So given we make a choice in Y, well, we need to know, first of all, how H will behave. So we play H using tau together Z. Then we see what everything in the future is gonna do, and that gives us the, the valuation at Y. And then we want to know the valuation at R. So this is the thing I said at the beginning of if we know if we know y and we know the value of z, then we know the value of y. So, so that's kind of what, what u is doing. Yes, this is a... I'm yeah I'm I'm che I'm cheating the notation because I'm writing I'm writing the v functor in its represented form, so so in in the category PC, g sigma sigma goes from xs to yr and h goes from i to xs. Okay. G sigma. Yeah, that's exactly what you wrote, but like that, that form there. No, that's no, no, no. That G, that yeah, that I think is way cooler. Than that. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a there's a balance. This this you can look at this and know what it is, but this way you can see the symmetry, mm. and it's also blatantly obvious that this thing is associative. For example, at least once you've proved that these things are functorial. So I mean. So in my thesis, I did it this way. And then there's like a 30 page proof that this thing is a category. So this is, this is a kind of modular way of doing it. But yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm giving you both ways, right? There's the, there's the mathematically neat derived, the kind of the post hoc, the post hoc way of doing it. And then there's the, the, the directly, uh, yeah. Okay. There's 15 minutes left. What's happening downstairs? One five. Yeah, what's happening downstairs? That sounds complicated. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure there is. Okay, let's do an example. Okay, so I was I was timing myself to end up to end up on the example of a one-player game. So I haven't told you the definition of the monoidal product of open games, and I'm not going to because we don't have time. If we had another hour, then I'd get onto that. Um, <coughs> so with uh, yes, it's a it's it's a no it's a it's a bit more complicated. No, no, it, it is a bit more complicated. Um, yeah, it's, it's the same. It's Cartesian product, pairwise Cartesian product and object. The problem is specifically yes, the the problem is the pr the problem is e specifically specifically k. You have to you have a so y you get given a function from y times y prime to r times r prime, and you want 
a y to r and a y prime to r prime, right? There's no canonical way to do that. You have to use the fact that you've also been given an x times x prime and you know how to play the games because you also have a strategy. So, and again, you've got to do some work to prove, prove that this thing satisfies all the axioms you need. And being a, I mean, being a symmetric model category means that the, the composition and tensor have to be kind of deeply related to each other. They can't just be two random things. And you could maybe multiply it by number of components. Yes, again, it's Cartesian product on, on strategy profiles. So I, I, could, I could tell you the definition, or I can give you an example of a one-player open game. So I haven't defined players yet. Um, so player, oh, okay, I'm gonna define a, a single shot decision, I'm gonna define a decision made by a player, and specifically a decision made without observation. So it's gonna be a, so this is a, so this is a player who a decision made by a player which observes nothing, chooses an x, and, and tries to optimize a real number. Um, so, a strategy, so I'm gonna define this, so I'm gonna define it by giving the three components. Um, so a strategy is just a choice, right? The, the player observes nothing, so their strategy is just a choice. Their, um, Given an X, given a strategy, we need to give a, a lens like this, and we know that this is, these things are in bijection with X's, so this thing is, so that is, it is the lens which in the V part takes the unique element of one and returns X, and in the other part takes some stuff and returns one, uh, blank. I should actually write this down because we're actually gonna need that. So that is to say uh, V of dx star is x and u of dx of star and uh, a real number is star. Okay. And now we need um, E of D, so this is gonna take a, a one and an X to R, and it's gonna give a power set of X. And we're gonna define it by E D star of K is argmax of K. That is to say, it's gonna to define to be the set of X's such that K of X is greater than or equal to k of x prime for all x prime. So up, in, up to this point, there's been no, no optimization. Everything's just been information flying around. So the optimization happens at the level of defining one particular decision at some particular point. And then you compose these things together. And as they compose together, these things get joined together properly into the equilibrium concept you want. Okay, so as a string diagram, this guy looks like this. Okay, 
Now, let's say we want to put this, this player in a situation where they're trying to maximize some function. So we're going to fix a function. Uh, let's call it Q from X to R. Okay, so this is some, some so we've picked some concrete X. We're going to pick some concrete function from X to, to reals. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so there's two different things you could do um, which were equivalent. Um, one is you can recognize that this thing is isomorphic to um, hum PC I X R. And oh, I didn't tell you the embedding of PC into open games. That's, that's worth doing. Um, that's the, that's the, play, the, the lens category. Four-legged lenses, uh, play and co-play. I'm, I'm still fixing on terminology here. Um, um, okay, so the objects are the same. So on objects, this is just the identity. Uh, what? Now the lambda, we want to take this to, so, so the idea is that these things should be like zero player open games. So in a zero player open game, the set of strategy profiles is one. The zero player open game has no strategic choices. They have to do the same thing every time. So it's an automaton. So one, having one strategy profile is like being an automaton. Um, the behavior of this G on this star is lambda. And then the last thing is what's, what's an equilibrium? And it turns out that, so you have two choices. This unique strategy could either be an equilibrium or it could not be an equilibrium. And the intuition is that equilibrium is a kind of negative notion that to not be an equilibrium in order to fail to be in equilibrium, there must be some specific concrete player who is dissatisfied and wants to deviate. So in a zero, zero player open game, there is nobody to be unhappy. So, uh, um, and uh, the, other, the other reason is that w when I define the equilibrium on a pair, it's this is true and this is true. And because it's an and, if one of these was false, it would just kill everything. So if this, if this was unhappy, then there'd be no equilibrium. It would just destroy everything. So, okay, this is, this is the embedding of, of lenses into open games as, as zero player things. So, so we can do this and just say immediately that um, we, have, we have this. Alternatively, um, oh, I have green. Um, alternatively, uh, we could take the forward lifting, for example, we could go Q, X, R, and then bend it round. And that gives you the same thing. You have to prove that, but that, that gives you the same thing. Or you can bend it round. So you've got three different ways of doing it. Okay, but in any case, we have an open game here. And if I write it out explicitly, um, I'm gonna abuse notation and call this thing Q as well. So this thing has one strategy profile. Um, the behavior of it on that, if you go forwards, uh, okay, I left this over here. If you go forwards, you observe some x, but you just return a star. Okay, now if you go backwards, you take in an x, and a thing here, and you need to return an R, so you return Q of X. Okay? Excuse my abuse of notation of also calling this open game Q. So this Q here refers to the open game. This Q here refers to the function. And the, equi the equilibrium condition is trivial that this star is always in equilibrium. Okay. And we've got three minutes left. 
and I haven't left enough time for questions, and the interesting part is coming up, and it's very sad. So, so when you compose these together, So we get an open game from 1, 1 to 1, 1. Now, the best of strategy profiles of this is going to be x times 1, which we know is isomorphic to x, but I'm going to keep it there just to be really clear. Um, play and co-play, um, we could work out, and it's a good exercise to work out, but we know it's trivial because it goes from 1, 1 to 1, 1. So there's, there's only one of these things. Um, so it's uniquely determined anyway. Now the E, okay, we need to take two things, but they end up both being trivial. So a state coming into one and a function from one to one. Okay, and this is gonna end up being um, um, so it's gonna be a pair consisting of an X and a star such that the x is in equilibrium of D and the star is in equilibrium of K, well, we know that that's always true. So in the equilibrium of D, remember, we had a state here, a continuation here, and we adjusted them. So for D, we need to adjust the continuation backwards, which means what we want here, um, it's star is the continuation. I'm writing it star because it's unique, but I'm going quickly. Um, adjusted by um, k played with star. Okay, and when you work this out, this ends up being, so it ends up, it, it's a lens from here to one, and it ends up being precisely k. I, mean, I guess you can imagine this. It's k composed with, it, this is the identity of one, so it's k composed with that, so it's just k. Um, and so what ends up happening is that when we test this, uh, the function, why am I calling it k? I, I've been calling it k, I meant to call it q. Okay, I've been saying q, k and q for the same thing. That's, that's just stupid. Okay, k and q are the same thing. Um, so what you end up with is this function, this concrete function we fixed ends up being fed in here, and then it ends up going in here and we end up choosing the set of x's which maximize q, which is what we want. Okay, and I have to stop there because we have coffee. That was anticlimactic in the end. I need another 15 minutes, but what can we do? In this one player situation, x, x should be a maximizing input of k. So it's, it's, it's game theoretically trivial. You just choose the maximum. Yeah. Yeah. So you need tensor product to do anything non-trivial. So to get two players who are strategically interacting, but okay. Let's go and have coffee. Also, give me questions. questions? Yes, questions quickly. Um, why <laughs> Yeah, so so this is this is a good question. Um, I, I, I don't know about that. I haven't heard of anything like that. That's a, okay. that's a fun idea. Um, I mean, there are reasons to be suspicious of Nash equilibrium. I'm, I'm doing the kind of bad economics thing that the math works out. Right. Nash equilibrium turns out to be composable than other things are more tricky. So some, some are possible with some tricks, some are don't know how to do. So for example, min-max strategies, I don't know how to figure out. Maybe it's possible. Yeah. And you get um, just have to just like a G. So 
you also get a sigma g that you return in both of Yeah. Sigma g being a bunch of lenses from excess yr. You've got a lens to r, you've got three lenses. Well, you think that you think that's the excess, excess to yr and yr to r. And you want to compose this so badly. But like, I see what you mean. Efficient sigma g is just a set. Although it is a set, it's indexing function. It's roughly a subset of lenses. You yeah. could compose those in a way. Is, is that an action that you want to compose? No, there's, there's only one lens from one one to one one. You don't want to compose them all together. Thank mm -hmm. you. 